Now I say this a lot, but how cool is this? This is Lieutenant Zach Farrell. This is Colonel Bill McPherson, the amazing Gene Kranz. You've never seen aerospace like this. During the Korean War, U.S. forces began using helicopters in warfare to a much greater extent. But existing helicopters lacked power and required a lot of maintenance. So the Army held a competition for a new design. In 1955, Bell Helicopter won the competition by building the HU-1A Iroquois, quickly nicknamed the Huey, which was later redesignated the UH-1A. During the Vietnam War, Hueys were uniquely suited to the challenges of fighting in the dense jungles, mountains, seasonal flooding, and a lack of general infrastructure in the country. The versatile Hilo was flown by the United States Army, Navy, Air Force, and Marines, as well as the Air Forces of many other countries. Nearly 65 years after the Huey's introduction, a few crews are still flying the venerable helicopter, but it has been widely replaced by the UH-60 Blackhawk. Still, Huey pilots have a saying, when the last Blackhawk goes to the boneyard, there will be a Huey crew there to pick them up. Now let's check out some of the features of the UH-1 Huey at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum. Now, what you didn't know is this is a Mike model, an M model, which was made specifically as a gunship, which means it's got a kind of an interesting rotor head. It's a 540 rotor head, which gives the, the blades way more play on the left, right, front, and back. That's because these guys carried a ton of ammunition, and you needed to be as maneuverable as possible because 1,400 horsepower sounds like a lot, but when you're carrying rockets and machine gun ammo and a bunch of people, that's not a lot of power. Plus, you got the humidity of Vietnam. That's not good for lift either. All right, people, this is the good stuff. I am here with a real live helicopter pilot who was in Vietnam, and you did how many tours? Three. Three tours. This is Colonel Bill McPherson. Thank you so much for being with us here today. This is a huge honor because, I hate to say it, but I consider you a friend of mine. We'll think about that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. Now, going back to the history of this thing, this guy actually flew in Vietnam. It was built in 1967 by Bell Helicopter in Fort Worth, Texas. So it went directly to Vietnam in 1967 and was issued and assigned to the 1st Battalion, 9th Air Cavalry Regiment, 1st Air Cavalry Division, Air Cavalry Division. <laughs> so No horses, just helicopters. That's right, that's right. And it served for three years. Wow. combat. It has uh, 21 bullet holes to uh, verify its combat time. It was used extensively as support for ground troops who needed gun support. It escorted troop carrying aircraft. It escorted medical evacuation aircraft and was extremely busy for three years, which takes a toll on the mechanics, the turbine, the rotor systems. So at the end of three years, it was shipped back to Bell Helicopter for rebuild in Amarillo, Texas. And as the war was winding down, they decided not to send it back to Vietnam, but issue it to the National Guard. So it was okay. issued to the Nebraska Army National Guard in 1971, and it was in 1996 that it was directed to fly to uh, White Sands to become part of this target drone program. And as, as the program was canceled a few years later, 
it sat there on the airfield until I was able to retrieve it. Well, tell you what, do you want to do a little quick walk around and sure. we can actually take a look at some of these places where it was shot? So what I did to uh, illustrate the bullet holes, I put decals over the holes. So the decals or stickers are on the patch. The patch covers the covers holes. Covers the holes. And you'll find all over the aircraft, there's 21, I believe, 21, 22 on the aircraft Whoa. right now. And in this case, they were going for the pilot because he that sat right there. That is correct. He sat right there. and. They didn't get him because the seat for the pilot and the co-pilot are bulletproof Kevlar, mm -hmm. the same thing the military helmets are right. made of. So wow. uh, he was safe. All right, so we discussed earlier this is a Mike model, which means it was purpose-built to be a gunship, and, well, you can see it's loaded for bear. Down here are two M60 flex mount machine guns. That's a 7.62 millimeter machine gun. And they were actually on a mount, two on each side that allowed them to move left and right and up and down. Not a lot, but just enough that you didn't have to really aim the helicopter as much as you would if they were a fixed mount. Now, inboard of the machine guns is something even scarier. Seven shot rocket pod with 2.75 inch folding fin aerial rockets. These guys were monsters. They could carry a high explosive warhead, white phosphorus, or even scarier, this guy. 2,200 in each rocket of a flechette. Think of it as a tiny steel arrow. This would just denude the countryside of any vegetation and anybody in it. Super scary. But What's this bad boy right here? It's just a door-mounted M60, and the M60 is the same thing that this guy was. This is in the infantry configuration, so if these guys went down, you could literally dismount this weapon and use it to defend yourself from the bad guys. So how much ammunition could these guys actually carry? Well, for example, this box right here will carry 500 belted 7.62 rounds. A lot of guys would carry 80 to 90 of these boxes to feed these behemoths down here. That's a lot of ammunition. But you gotta keep in mind, you can't just load yourself down with ammo because you gotta keep fuel in mind. And if you got a long mission, you gotta have more fuel and less ammo. But if you got a short mission, you can really load up on this and stay on station for quite a bit longer. We are here with Lieutenant Colonel Ken Overturf. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. I'm going to take this thing off my head. <laughs> oh, it's very cool, though. Um, you flew H models, and you flew for a Project Left Bank. That's correct. And that was looking for radio signals and... Locating the enemy via radio uh, intercepts. And where were you doing that? Uh, at, uh, at that time... The 1st Cavalry Division, the unit that I, I flew with, uh, was headquartered in Phuc Vinh, uh, Vietnam, uh, in the War Zone C, uh, right about the middle of South Vietnam. Okay. For our viewers, and especially me, can you take us through kind of what it's like, some tips and tricks on how to fly the Huey? Let's do um, uh, a brief uh, <laughs> helicopter flying 101. Excellent. The uh, three maneuver controls on this helicopter. We'll go through them one at a time. Okay. Starting with the first one is the cyclic. The uh, stick, if you will, uh, right between your legs. This cyclic provides the uh, horizontal movement in the helicopter. And how it does that is when the rotor head is spinning at its operational RPM of 6,600 revolutions per minute, it becomes like a giant dinner plate, and you can envision this a giant dinner plate. Okay. Now, with this cyclic, what you're doing is balancing that giant dinner plate. Tip the cyclic forward, the dinner plate tips forward, and the aircraft moves forward. Uh, next control is the collective. 
This uh, control gives the your uh, vertical movement capability. Uh, when you're ready to go up, pull the collective up, and it puts pitch in the blades of that spinning plate. Then we go to the third control, which are the anti-torque pedals. The the torque, uh, the power torque caused by the power when you're uh, putting pitch in the blades uh, moves us into Newton's third law of motion. For every action, the rotor head spinning counterclockwise, an equal and opposite reaction, the fuselage would tend to turn um, clockwise. Okay. So to fly this helicopter, all you have to do is balance the dinner plate, manage your vertical and uh, uh, ascent, descent, and keep the nose straight with the pedals all the time. Oh, well, that's not hard. <laughs> Guys, thank you so much. Pleasure. Colonel Bill, Colonel Ken, it's always a pleasure to be with you. Certainly. But guess what? I'm going to go see what has taken the place, but will never replace mm -hmm. the Huey. You got it. And that is the Blackhawk. In the late 1970s, the United States Army started replacing the UH-1 Huey with the UH-60 Blackhawk as their new tactical transport helicopter. Manufactured by Sikorsky Aircraft, modified versions of the Blackhawk have been developed for the U.S. Navy, Air Force, and Coast Guard. These have been designated the Seahawk for the Navy, Pavehawk for the Air Force, and Jayhawk for the Coast Guard. Luckily, we have some friends at the United States Coast Guard, Sector San Diego, who are going to show us the ins and outs of the Jayhawks in their fleet. The origins of this station can be traced back to the 1930s, when the city of San Diego wanted to have a Coast Guard presence, given the increasing maritime traffic. Today, there are over 400 individuals on base, including active duty personnel and civilians. They also have three MH-60T Jayhawks, including one gorgeous yellow one. But right now, we're going to talk to Sector Response Chief and Air Ops Officer, Commander Chris Wright, about the Coast Guard and the work being done by this station. So tell us a little bit about the Coast Guard. What do you guys really do? So the Coast Guard is pretty unique in the fact that we're the, one of the five military branches, uh, but we actually are not under the Department of Defense, we're under the Department of Homeland Security. And as one of these five military branches, we actually execute all typical defense military missions if needed, but we actually also transition to 11 statutory missions, so things like search and rescue, homeland security missions, uh, pollution response, oh, wow. even ice breaking, uh, that all falls under the Coast Guard. And what we like to say is we're sort of the protectors of mariners who are in distress. We also protect the homeland against threats that are coming from the sea, and we even protect the sea itself. So I referred to you as response chief. That means that anything that happens in, in this area, you're gonna be the guy to send out boats, air assets, anything that you have here at the base, is that correct? Yeah, it's kind of a unique position. So I get to do the fun stuff, like when we talk about the helicopter, yeah. we get to fly that and still stand duty but our three 87-foot patrol boats uh, fall under my you know, operations and tactical control of the sector, and I help manage that, uh, as well as our small boat station, which has four uh, small boats that act as tactical pursuit operations, law enforcement, and search and rescues. Can we go do a walk around on the Hilo? Well, I would love to, but I actually have to run and, and deal with some response stuff, so we have an awesome lieutenant who will be able to walk you through all the ins and outs of the helicopter. Does he have a mustache? Because I don't want a lieutenant with a mustache. This is the helicopter I was talking about. This yellow guy, I love this paint scheme. It's not typical and we're gonna find out why, but how cool is this? Now somewhere around here is a pilot that we're gonna talk to. All we gotta do is just kinda wait around for him or so. Hey, you must be Matthew. You must be the mustache. Yeah, it's me. Can't have an aviation show without a mustache. That's right? very true. <laughs> okay, he's not actually called the mustache. Well, maybe he is, I don't know. But this is the Lieutenant Zach Farrell and he's gonna walk us around this helicopter. All right, LT, yeah. let's talk about this paint scheme. What gives? So, the Coast Guard in 1916 had its first flight. Okay. 2016, 
right here on our sweet patch, <laughs> we, uh, we celebrated 100 years of Coast Guard aviation. So earlier Coast Guard aircraft, they flew a yellow paint scheme. It's kind of like how the NFL will do a throwback color. Oh, Coast sweet. Guard's doing the same thing. Very cool. All right, so let's talk about the bird. Where do you want to start? Absolutely. So let's just kind of talk about the MH-60 as a whole. So, okay. so the Coast Guard actually has two helicopters. They've got an MH-65, the Dolphin, and the MH-60 Tango, which is kind of the, the, the special that we're focusing on today. Right. And it's the Jayhawk. So Sikorsky initially built this aircraft because they wanted a combat aircraft. Mm -hmm. So it's very redundant. It's got three hydraulic systems. It has multiple electrical systems. It has multiple fuel lines feeding the engines. Whoa. The idea was you did not want this helicopter to be taken down when it's getting hit with enemy fire. Right. So very redundant. It's designed to fly into a combat zone, take on shots, put troops on the ground, get out. It really gives you kind of a nice feeling knowing that the helicopter is so structurally sound when we're taking it hundreds of miles offshore yeah. Oh, yeah. to affect whatever the mission might be. Let's do a walk around on this guy. Absolutely. Where do you want to start? So let's start over here at the cabin door, and then okay. we'll kind of just make our way around. Yeah, I like it. Literally right above my head yes. are, or is one of the engines. Yes, yeah, so one of two. One engine's capable of putting out about 1,800 horsepower. Whoa. Uh, in the event that the pilot needed a little more, we've got a switch that we can hit in the cockpit. It gives us about 200 more horsepower. It burns the engine a little bit, but it's just nice to know that the helicopter has that capability built in in the event that you ever did need more power. So commonly people will ask, oh, is this a bomb or is this a torpedo? No, this is an external fuel tank, and we've got one on this side of the helicopter. If we were to walk around to the other side, there'd be two more. I think these fuel tanks and kind of our range and our capability is one of the things that sets the Coast Guard apart. Mm -hmm. We're capable of putting 6,000 pounds of fuel on this helicopter, which gives us about six flight hours, wow. um, a range of about 600 miles. Theoretically, we'd go 250 to 300 miles offshore. We could hover for about 30 minutes, enact a rescue, and then fly 250 to 300 miles back. What I would say happens even more frequently is we'll get a report of a person overboard or a flare sighting or a mayday, and we have to go and we have to search for these people. The other services, it's my understanding that they use the 60, is kind of like a, we're gonna go from A to B, we're gonna mm -hmm. affect the mission. They don't need as much fuel. With the Coast Guard, any given day, somebody could sound the, uh, the mayday off their radio. It comes to our watch standards, and now we found ourselves in a search that might last us six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. And this, uh, this helicopter has the capability to go out there, fly that entire search pattern, cover a large expanse of area, searching for whatever individual may be in need. And oftentimes, because we have that capability, it will end in a successful evolution where ideally we've saved somebody's life. That really does set you guys apart. That's impressive. <clears throat> Since we're kind of relating this back to the Huey, one of the big differences is the rotor system itself. So on the Huey, it, it, was, it was a two-blade system. This yep. is a four-blade system. Yes. But there's another difference, and it's in the rotor head somehow? In the rotor head. Yeah, so the, uh, the Huey had, it was a teetering rotor system. And so the, the rotor system would actually kind of teeter back and forth about the mast. And it gave that classic wop, 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 wop yeah. that, that you, you often correlate with, you know, old movies on Vietnam or whatever it Platoon. is. Platoons. Yeah. <laughs> so the great thing about the 60 is it's got a rigid rotor system. And so basically all the components are about one solid titanium hub, which is connected to the mast. And there's not any play there. So it's just a really solid rotor system. The benefit to that is it takes on various G loads a whole lot more effectively than the old Huey did. And it's just a much more stable platform. And then you mix that in with the stabilization systems that we have built into this helicopter. And this helicopter produces a very smooth ride. Speaking of UH-1s, we were in the cockpit of a, a Huey earlier, an actual Vietnam era um, Huey. That's awesome. I know that the cockpit has got to be different than that thing. Can we go check this one out? Yeah. Absolutely, let's move up to the cockpit. Yeah, yeah. This looks totally different than the Huey. Just a little bit. What's going on with all of these screens? So what you're probably used to seeing, what I imagine the Huey at the museum looks like, 
is you probably have steam gauges everywhere. Yep. A bunch of switches, probably not a lot of the electronics that you're seeing here. The good folks at Coast Guard headquarters decided to bring us into the 21st century. <laughs> and so what you've got in front of you is you have five MFDs, multifunctional displays, Whew. and they will display all of our instrumentation. Additionally, we can pull up video systems while we search. We've got a camera underneath the helicopter that can aid in a search. It can pull up infrared imagery to pick up body heat if we're looking for a survivor. Wow. So we can actually control the camera from this joystick here in the oh, center. Oh, no kidding. So either the pilot or the co-pilot can operate. It kind of swivels back and forth. The flight mech in the back or the rescue swimmer, they actually have their own joystick as well, as well as their own screen to where they can operate it and the pilot Whoa. flies. It's all about divvying out tasks in the cockpit to make sure that you're the pilot flying, your primary job is to fly. Mm. I'm the pilot monitoring or the safety pilot. My primary job is to back you up, to run radios, to make sure that the aircraft's safe. And then we've got a rescue swimmer who can be helping with the videography. We've got the flight mech who can be looking outside the cabin door. It's really like a cohesive team effort to make sure that the mission is done as effectively and as safely as possible. You fly these things, you probably know how to like start this bad boy up. Yeah, I might be able to I might be able to give a peek. Andy, we good to uh, pull some power? All right. So, oh, yeah. As we fire it up, it's a little loud. Yeah. Cuz there's a lot of electricity that's coming to each of these units. So the screen closest to you, that's your primary flight display. Okay. It gives you your airspeed. Heading your heading, your attitude indicator, altitude. In the center, we like to keep all of our engine instruments so that the pilot can reference, I'm the co-pilot, I can reference. I can pull up a video display. And so right now, you can see your camera guy there in the back. Oh, that's So awesome. I've got him on our camera as he <laughs> has his camera on us. All right, we're halfway there. Can we go fly? You know what? I think we've got something lined up. Oh my god. Yeah, let's go do it. Oh let's yeah, get yeah, yeah, it yeah. up yeah. first. All right, even better. All right, let's go. How cool is this? Not only did I get to ride along with the Coast Guard, but I got a front row seat during an actual training drill. A standard search and rescue crew is made up of a rescue swimmer, a flight mechanic, a pilot, and a co-pilot. Depending on the situation, rescue swimmers can free fall from the helicopter or be lowered down via the rescue hook onto a boat or directly into the water. Swimmers deploy from helicopters for medical cases on cruise ships or tankers, and they also respond to boats taking on water or rescue people who are already in the water. I can't say enough about the swimmers. They're extremely well-trained, focused, and mentally tough. I suppose you have to be to jump out of a moving helicopter. It's the most widely used American military helicopter of all time and the icon of the Vietnam War. Its legacy continues to this day with the sounds of its blades still filling the skies. From taking a tour of the Huey at Wings Over the Rockies Air and Space Museum with the men who flew it, to riding along with the United States Coast Guard in the MH-60 Jayhawk, we've taken you behind the wings of the UH-1 Iroquois. Hey, I'm Matthew Burchette, and this, my friends, is behind the wings, and I think we're in trouble. Now, I say this a lot, but how cool is this? This is Lieutenant Zach Farrell. Lieutenant General Christopher Coates, the amazing Gene Kranz. You've never seen aerospace like this. Hi, welcome back to Wings Over the Rockies. 
my favorite place in the world, you are going to totally dig this episode because it's on NORAD. Now, what is NORAD? Well, we're going to get to that in a minute, but let's do a little bit of a history lesson here. At the end of World War II, we had not been bombed by any power except the Japanese and shelled by the Japanese and German submarines. When you think about it, we got really, really lucky. We didn't have to go through any of the horrendous bombing campaigns that Germany, Great Britain, Italy went through. We just kind of sat back here, sheltered from the rest of the war by two gigantic oceans. Well, that started to come to an end in 1945. We quickly discovered that the Germans were leaps and bounds ahead of us in technology. The V-2 rocket, the America bomber, what was the best way to defend yourself in the late 1940s? Radar. We got with Canada and we started to develop a system that they called the Dew Line. And it was actually three sets of radar. There was the Dew Line, which was the distant early warning line, the Pine Tree Line, and then the Mid-Canada Line. Well, that was all great when we were worried about Russian bombers. But in 1957, when the Russians launched their first ICBM, the Intercontinental Ballistic Missile, things got a little bit dicey. So what do you do? You come up with NORAD. What does that mean? Well, that, my friends, is what we are going to discover today. The North American Aerospace Defense Command, you know it as NORAD, was first approved by the United States Joint Chiefs of Staff in 1957. At the time, it was called the North American Air Defense Command and had its headquarters at Ent Air Force Base in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Following construction of an underground facility at Cheyenne Mountain in the 1960s, NORAD's command post moved under the mountain to monitor the airspace over Canada and the United States. In 2008, NORAD moved its day-to-day -day operations to Peterson Air Force Base in Colorado Springs and redesignated Cheyenne Mountain as an Air Force Station and the Backup Command Center. Proceed and identify. Uh, okay, Control. I have an identification. You won't believe it. It's you-know-who. Aside from assessing daily aerospace threats, NORAD is also responsible for tracking Santa with their NORAD Track Santa program. And so we use NORAD's standard equipment to track Santa, the stuff that we use to protect and defend North America every day of the year. To learn more about NORAD's mission, let's head over to their headquarters at Peterson Air Force Base and talk with the Deputy Commander, Lieutenant General Christopher Coates. So what is the overarching mission of NORAD? NORAD's mission has always been the defense of our nations, Canada and the United States, or the defense of the homelands. Um, what we've seen uh, over the last year or two, and it's reflected both in the Canadian defense policy, strong, secure, engaged, and the U.S. national defense strategy, is that our nations, our homeland, is no longer a sanctuary. And we've noted that our adversaries, our potential adversaries, uh, China and Russia in particular, have developed capabilities to be able to hold us at risk here in North America. Uh, with very advanced weapon systems by combining uh, their uh, capabilities so they operate as we would say across different domains both from in, at sea uh, holding our space assets at risk operating in the cyber domain and the information domain and then NORAD in our classic air defense mission is challenged but in ways that we haven't been before as all of these threats come together at once and then, so we're in the midst of a transformation of NORAD, refocusing on uh, our ability to defend the homeland, reduce that risk down to a, an acceptable level, really to be able to deter threats before they uh, manifest themselves. One of the things that our, our sharp viewers, of which they all are sharp, are going to catch on is that I said NORAD is here at Peterson. Most people think Cheyenne Mountain. They've seen Stargate SG-1, they've seen all these Hollywood movies, and it's always in the mountain. Why have you guys taken yourselves out of the mountain and come down here? Well, first what I'd say is NORAD isn't just 
either in the mountain or here at, at Peterson. <laughs> NORAD is all the way from Alaska down to Tyndall Air Force Base, and we even have people in Greenland at uh, Thule Air Base in, in Greenland. So NORAD's bigger than, than just where the headquarters just one happens location. to be, yeah. um, but you're right. For a long time, NORAD headquarters and our operations center was inside Cheyenne Mountain. After the events of 9-11, uh, the role of NORAD expanded uh, slightly to include the defense, the air defense of, of our internal air at the same time. It was seen to be more effective at the time to move the operation center out of Cheyenne Mountain, the principal operation center, into Peterson Air Force Base here in, in the basement of the building we're in right now. Um, so we've operated here for about 15 years with the operation center, but we maintain uh, the command center in Cheyenne Mountain. It's our alternate command center. Uh, we use it quite frequently to make sure that it's all up and ready to go, um, can do the job it has to do, and there's some reasons why Cheyenne Mountain uh, was important and remains important for NORAD. What's your favorite part about the job? There's sort of two aspects. The first is the problem solving, and um, at uh, the level that I get to see things uh, interplayed, it's the strategic mixed in with the tactical, so what are our governments expecting of us, what are the resources we've been given, and how do we balance that with what's happening uh, globally, um, and ensuring that we're at the right place at the right time, uh, providing the right information to our decision makers. Secondly, and perhaps what matters the most is we're here protecting our nations, our homeland. Mm -hmm. um, and so while military operations everywhere uh, are important, um, the job we get up for in the morning is making sure that our citizens are safe. Uh, and that's uh, super, super rewarding. So one of the things, if you're, if you're in the military, if you're a sports person, you know that constant training is what keeps you sharp. And you guys are constantly running training exercises here in what you call N2C2, which is kind of where everything happens and we have been lucky enough to be told that we may be able to go down there. I am pretty excited because that is not something that almost anybody gets to go to. So as much as I have enjoyed speaking with you, um, I want to see how far I can get without being tackled. So sir, thank you so much. Thank you. And if need be, can you get me out of the brig? We'll try. Okay, thank you. What does N2C2 actually stand for? So N2C2 stands for the NORAD and US NORTHCOM Current Operations Center. And what we do here is essentially uh, all domain situational awareness and threat characterization, if I can put it very broadly like that. We're watching for Russian bombers, for missile attacks to North America, or for domestic threats. So aircraft, think of like 9-11, uh, aircraft flying around in the airspace, um, violating uh, uh, certain air, airspace rules or uh, doing anything that could be a threat. That's what I'm assuming all of these screens are doing. So what are we looking at up there? Unfortunately, we can only show you the unclassified stuff that we normally do. <laughs> normally we work <laughs> at sense. much higher security level. Um, but what we have up there, we're always monitoring the news um, because we can find out a lot of things about what's happening domestically on the news. Mm -hmm. The, one of the screens there with all the green dots on it shows all the air traffic within the continental United States right now. Okay. We also post up weather things or other uh, information that pertains to uh, missile warning and missile defense. What we have here in the, in the command center is the command domain, um, which is run by a colonel. So in this case, Colonel uh, Brad Smith, who's my U.S. Air Force counterpart, my U.S. Air Force brother, our deputy command center director, who happens to be a Canadian today, um, Lieutenant Colonel Jody Hansen. Um, we also have our enlisted uh, controllers that help us deal with uh, conferencing, managing the knowledge wall, those types of things. And then out on the floor, we have uh, the rest of our domains. So we have a land and maritime domain uh, that looks for things uh, for example, southwest border, hurricanes, fires, floods, uh, domestic terrorist attacks, any of those kind of things. Um, we've got our air domain, which is primarily there for uh, defense of North American airspace, like Russian bombers um, or Operation Noble Eagle, and we'll talk a bit more about that in a bit. We've got uh, meteorology, we've got a, a Federal Aviation Administration representative, um, we've got cyber watch officer, we've got missile defense and missile and, and space warning. So we're keeping an eye on pretty much, when I mentioned earlier, all domain situational awareness. We want to know what's going on, anything that could be a security threat to North America 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So speaking of aircraft flying around, one of the, the terms that I've heard a lot is Noble Eagle. Right. What exactly is that? Operation Noble Eagle is an operation that's been in place since 9-11, uh, where 
uh, NORAD has a role of defending North America from any aerospace threat like that. So uh, an aircraft that's hijacked, people that are lost or uh, causing uh, potential disruption to air traffic flows, those types of things. So in reality, how often does that happen? A lot more often than you think, actually. Um, most of them are general aviation aircraft that uh, don't really pay attention to the rules or the notices that are out there, but uh, on average about three to five times a week. Whoa, that's way more than I would have expected. So what happens when something like that pops up? Um, then what will happen is that, uh, that uh, region will give us a call and say, hey, there's something weird going on. We may have a conversation about it. Or they may just say, hey, we're scrambling fighters. We're reacting to this. And then we'll do what's ringing out, what we call ringing out an Operation Noble Eagle Conference. And what we do is we make sure that we get the right people with the right information. If we can't talk to them on the radio, then we'll try and intercept them with fighters or helicopters, depending on how fast and how high they are. Nine times out of ten, what does it turn out to be? Just some guy not reading the notams, just not paying attention, not talking to the tower? I would probably say ninety nine and a half times out of ten, that's usually what it is. Particularly if uh, the president's traveling or if it's a temporary flight restricted area that's not normally there. So uh, we have a Super Bowl in Atlanta. Um, people that normally fly around Atlanta aren't necessarily used to suddenly having more airspace yeah. restrictions. So if they're not reading the notams, uh, they fly through the middle of the temporary flight restricted area, then we'll take action to make sure that uh, we, we keep it secure. So we're lucky enough to be here on a day where you're going to run an exercise and we would love to be a part of that and watch. Is that okay? Absolutely. We run exercises all the time. Um, awesome. The crews are highly proficient at it. They do this stuff every day, day in, day out, and they're really good at it. All right, let's go. This is actually going to be an exercise where like a, a small civilian aircraft is unresponsive and they're in restricted airspace. So this scenario is uh, restricted airspace in the area of Denver. Um, uh, Beechcraft Baron um, is squawked 7500, which is a hijack code oh. and is unresponsive. And we're going through the steps right now. So, okay. Based on uh, track location and uh, heading, we're going to request a military assistance at this time. So if you look up on the screen, they've highlighted the track um, that's flying. This, the red circle is, is showing the uh, temporary flight restricted area. Um, All right, uh, counter is tracking. EACs, please ring out and exercise ONEC long pull. Copy, exercise ONEC. Still access ONEC. So an Operation Noble Eagle conference is the means that we use to share information between all the involved security agencies. So that's ONEC. Right, okay. so that's, that's what ONEC stands for. They'll ring out all of the different stations. So it's Department of Homeland Security, it's uh, Transportation Security Agency, all of those types of uh, FAA, FBI, whoever that are involved so that we, if anybody has information they can pass and it'll help with decision making. What the CCD has done is he just labeled it as a target of interest, which now means that uh, we've officially kicked off the Noble, Operation Noble Eagle. Okay, so the controllers at the, at the sectors are controlling the fighters. So they're talking to the fighters saying, okay, your mission is to go intercept and inspect. At this point, we're assuming that they're a threat until we can confirm that they're, they're not. not. In, in the vast majority of cases, obviously they're not. Yeah. It's not just general aviation aircraft. Sometimes we have uh, airliners that miss a frequency changeover, those kind of things. Hmm. Um, those ones are tricky. If they're going into Washington, into Reagan National, like right downtown, um, they're on flight plan or they're on a standard arrival. They got 150 passengers in the back, but they're not talking to the right people. We start to get a little bit, get a little bit nervous. Like, we're expecting he's going to probably, he's going to roll it onto his frequency, expecting to talk to tower and he's not realize he's on the wrong frequency. And then everybody kind of switches over and then we breathe a sigh of relief, right? But, <laughs> but we're always ready to react because we never know, right? 9-11 yeah. showed that we, we have to be ready to react at any time. At any time. But what we'll do is, depending on the speed of the target, if the F-16s, uh, they'll do an identification and say, okay, in this case, it's a Beach Baron. Um, here's what I see in the cockpit. You know, the guy's slumped over the controls, or I see a bad looking dude with a gun, or whatever the scenario happens to be. We're a minute away. Um, now we're prepared to see what the fighters are gonna tell us to help build situational awareness. Okay, mm -hmm. is this really a bad guy? What's going on? And keep up with the exercise. Uh, with the information that was provided in the aircraft uh, originally planning to this box 7700 for an emergency with smoke in the cockpit, we would like him to divert to Fort Morgan Municipal Airport to the east. So the, the fighters intercepted. 
got his attention. He realized he squawked the wrong code, passed, you know, back talking to air traffic control now, so he's in contact, compliant. And we've kind of done our part of it, and then the FAA will deal with, um, you know, making sure he gets safely on the ground and diverting him. That kind so of at this point, are the, will the 16s break off, or will they actually follow him to Fort Morgan? Uh, typically, if he's compliant and in contact with air traffic control, then, then they'll carry on with whatever mission they were doing before. All right, the training exercise is complete, but you know what's cooler than seeing an intercept from inside in 2C2? Seeing it from the skies! Get ready, because I'm heading up with pilot Alan Wimmer to experience an intercept by an F-16 from the cockpit of this Cessna 182. Yeah, great day to fly. Oh, beautiful. So we're flying with Alan Wimmer today. And Alan flew F-16s for the Air Force, but tell us what you're doing now. So I retired from the Air Force three years ago, and I took a job as a civil servant, so now I'm a civilian employee of the Air Force. I work at headquarters NORAD, North American Aerospace Defense Command, as what your episode is about. And one of the duties that I perform there is to be uh, part of the, what we call the Baron team, as in Red Baron. Oh, we yeah. We go out and okay. play the role of a bad guy uh, <laughs> to try and train our air defense uh, units as well as periodically do evaluations of their performance. So who are we going to be today? So today we are simulating uh, some civilians who are out enjoying a beautiful day. Uh, we're out flying to a destination or just flying in the local area, and we're unaware that a temporary flight restriction has been put up. That is temporarily restricted airspace that we're not allowed to go into, right? And for some reason, that has been declared as such. Uh, typically, that'll be associated with a national special security event. Okay. Those are uh, assessed and declared by the Department of Homeland Security. And if they need air defense, NORAD will provide that. Okay, so at this point, I probably should break in and say, it's always good to read your notams. Absolutely. <laughs> Those t temporary flight restrictions will always be posted in the notams. Let's just go ahead and make the FAA happy and say, Absolutely. pilots, please read your notams. Accidents happen. Humans are what they are. Yes. So our aerospace warning mission is to detect anybody that's coming along. And then our aerospace control mission, as it would apply in the scenario today, is that person stumbling into the airspace. Now we need to figure out what's going on. Is this just an accident? Is this someone who might have malintent? Is it someone who's going to comply with our instructions? Yes or no. And then the scenario will play out from there. Do we have a medical emergency? I mean, right. who knows? And so we'll train uh, the pilots at Buckley. We'll train to the, all sorts of those. We'll train to an incapacitated pilot with someone who's not a pilot who's Ooh. now flying the airplane. Yo, -ho, I need help. Yeah. Uh, and they're happy to have it. We'll train to uh, a pilot, a student pilot who's lost. I don't know where I'm at. I'm getting low on fuel. Can you please help me find a piece of runway to land on? Then we'll train to drug runners. We'll train to folks who are trying to do something illicit or illegal and not compliant. And then we'll train to the person who literally has malintent. I think a lot of people are aware that intercepts happen, but I don't think they're aware that they happen with small aircraft like this. I don't think they're aware either, but with the small aircraft, it's just not something that you see or hear about very no. often. Uh, so in general, are they going to be kind of at our 10 or 11? Well, you're not going to see them by oh. intent until they want you to. So in general, they're going to approach from behind. Most civilians are cruising along with yeah, the front of the side. Most of them aren't checking six. Doing the, right. doing the scan. And so they're going to approach uh, from our left side. And uh, the first time they approach us will most likely be to take a look at us, read a tail number, verify who we are, relay that data to the command and control authorities, and tell them, first off, what they're seeing. Who is this? What are they doing? What do they look like? Do they look like they have a problem? What's the tail number? Immediately, DHS uh, is on that uh, conference, as you saw the Operation Noble Eagle conference from the command center. DHS will be on there as soon as somebody gets a tail number. The FAA and the DHS are both running that. They know who owns it. They know where that airplane's been, what it's done, what that pilot's done. And so we'll begin to assess what we think is going on here. The command and control authorities will begin that assessment based on all of that data. We are ready in the east and we are weapon safe. Copy weapon safe. Baron is uh, ready in the west. That's what I want to hear. Fight's on. 
Okay, here we go. We're playing out the scenario now. Okay, here we go. Guys, this is 2628, Army Air Defense Fighter. There's your call. Aircraft southeast of Lahunta, 9000, track 041, 20 nautical miles south of Lahunta. You're pushing your restricted airspace, you're ordered to turn left to north immediately. Contact ATC on 123.1. 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 Contact AT